You carry these coins. Yeah, but you see, this should be just the screen. Oh, I see. I need to now this thing here. There we go. Yeah, yeah, you've heard it. And uh, you're the mute on your microphone. Um, uh, so, see, yeah, because I think this thing has the microphone here, right? So, right. otherwise, it will be. Well, I think that everybody now is hearing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very uh, Let me introduce you. Okay. okay. Good morning, everybody. We are going to start uh, the session of this uh, Severo Chua seminar. And I'm very glad to introduce Professor Sanjay Gopukiki. He is a distinguished professor at civil and environment engineer at the University of California. And his career is so long and really interesting, but I want to remark that he obtained a PhD from the Stanford University and worked as a consultant for several uh, government and uh, private corporations. Uh, what I want to remark is that uh, Professor Gobit G uh, got the CNK uh, prize, and uh, it's uh, really interesting because the room is uh, <laughs> yeah, the CNK room. So uh, he has a lot of uh, uh, honors in his career, and I don't want to extend too much. So please welcome and uh, thank, thank you. George. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's it's nice to be here in the St. David room. I can see all of it back there. <laughs> So we're watching. He's, he's watching over me. Yeah. When I won the Zinkavich medal, there was a there was age restriction, so that you had to be thirty five and under. And before the award ceremony, he tried to test whether I'd actually lied about my age by asking a very tricky question about when I was born. So, but I, I was actually I don't eligible for the prize at the time. So. But it's, it's it's great to be here. Thank you uh, for coming, and I am pleased also to give an excuse for those who, who escape the faculty <laughs> meeting because I know what that means. <laughs> so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, some computational techniques for phase transforming materials. This is something I've been working on for a long time, and I usually give very technically dense talks. And today, what I try to do is give a non-technically dense talk. Eugenio uh, said. Uh, please go easy on us. <laughs> and so actually I have a very limited number of equations in my slide today. And, and what I wanna do is I, I wanna start by, let's see, first trying to make sure that this works. Uh, talking about, or showing you some curious phenomena in materials. And then say a few words about the physics that underlies this behavior. Then say some words about how one constructs models and then demonstrate how those models function with respect to these materials and being able to predict their behavior. So that, that's my goal today. Uh, a lot of pictures, a few equations, and some, some ideas, I think, is an important part. And hopefully, I will fit this into the allotted time. So, so let me start with this. These, these Images here are from something known as uh, liquid crystal elastomers. And this movie here is uh, actually a light activated material. And so you have a piece of material here being shined by a laser and it undergoes a conformational change at the molecular level. And then it allows it to walk around. Uh, so, and this is another demonstration of the same material here, polarized slightly differently. 
but it starts here at a given length. You heat it, it contracts, which you would expect for a polymer. But if you cool it, it goes back, which is something you would not expect. Okay. And so there is a, a, a phase transformation occurring in this material. Uh, these materials do some pretty unusual things. This is an example of the same type of material. There's a balloon here, and it's capped at both ends, and a pressure is applied. And so you're inflating the balloon. Oh, let's see. Good question. Um, okay, we will fix the, that which people are not seeing. No, let's do that. I think you had to turn it on. Uh, you are your screen sharing. Yeah. That's what I have. So I think last yesterday we turned something on here on this thing that allowed this then to share. <laughs> Probably not sharing the. Uh, well, that's on my computer now. Computer, so maybe you should do. Ah, is it? Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. No, try it. It's being controlled by your computer, not the. Yeah. Not ours. Well, that's what I tried. I'm still not sure. You should share your desktop. Oh, ah, okay. okay. And then we will see exactly the same thing that we have on here. Ah, perfect. No. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. So for those that missed it, it's good to share. We'll show the first slide here very briefly, but I won't repeat what I said. So at least you can see the light activated uh, return. Okay. So this, this, this is an interesting demonstration here. This is a balloon. And when you play a balloon, this is what you normally expect. You put air into it, you get a bulge, the thing expands, all right? That's the usual thing on your party balloon. Uh, this material here, you start filling it up and it goes back the other direction, okay? And eventually it does expand like you expect, but it has this very strange intermediate state in the material. Uh, this is uh, just a, a quick movie of this. This is all from the laboratory of Shenkin Kai at University of California in San Diego. But that, that's putting pressure into the balloon, which if you know statics, applies a force down on that weight, uh, but it goes the other direction. So very unusual type of material. You can do some other super cool things with this. This is a, Piece of that material compressed 50%, so it's just a little sheet compressed at 50%. And this is the reflection off it as it slowly re expands, going from blue to red. Uh, these are just the reflection curves. But you can do something super cool with this is that you can pump this with a laser and you can get emission bands at very specific frequencies, very narrow band emissions by just sort of controlling compression. So this is basically a, a color tunable laser that you can make out of this material. Okay. And the, I'll explain a little bit about the, the, the molecular basis of this phenomena in a second, but I just want to show you a different class of materials that has the same mathematical structure underlying them. And these are a little bit more common, uh, either are shaped memory alloys. So you can have a little wire here, you can deform it, what appears to be plastically. And then if you expose it to a little bit of heat, it nicely recovers entirely the shape that you started with. So it's very large deformation that appears permanent and it goes back. Uh, people have done some super cool things with this. Uh, this is a little device here that employs this material in these essentially ropes here. And if it works, there we go. You get a little uh, heat engine there. So, and so you have a solid state working material here as opposed to a gas or a liquid or something. 
Uh, just a few more examples before getting into the details here. This is actually one of my favorite uses of this material. This company made a shirt out of this using the material as the fibers here. And so the shirt irons itself for you, which is really nice. If you're like me, my wife always complains I look like I slept in my shirt because I don't iron my shirts very often. But uh, the, this, by the way, this shirt only comes in one color, which is gray. <laughs> um, and it's fantastically expensive. Um, uh, a much more common use of these materials, they're used quite quite a bit in medical devices. I actually have three of these in my heart. Uh, these are stents. Uh, this is a Venicava filter here, uh, but they're often used in, in, in medical braces. Uh, and, and now for the shape memory effect, these materials also have something called super elastic effect. If the alloy properly, you can put 15, 20% strain into them and they can spring back elastically. And, there, there are a number of reasons why this is phys physiologically very interesting. Uh, my last example here, uh, I've also had this done to myself too. Uh, <laughs> I don't know anybody has been had a root canal. Uh, they use this little thing here called an entodontic file. It, that's a big expansion, it's a little tiny thing. Uh, but this is an X-ray, it goes through the, the the root in your tooth, and you can see this is, of course, a 2G, 2D projection, a very complicated path. And then what the guy is going to do is he's going to attach a motor onto the end of this thing and spin this thing around. Okay. So you can imagine, you know, you can already see that curvature there at the end there, what kind of strain this thing is going to undergo. Uh, so, and it, this application takes advantage of the super elastic effect in these materials. But, the thing that you really hope in this situation is that the fatigue life of the material is high because sometimes this thing will snap there and then that guy is going to try and pull that thing out. Uh, sometimes they can't and then they just shove some stuff up in here and glue it in and just leave it. So, but uh, these are uh, all some kind of interesting behaviors. These materials, these metals and those plastics or polymers have very similar underlying microscopic physics to that. And so I'd like to say a little bit about both cases. Uh, so the, the first set of materials I said are, are liquid crystal elastomers. Let me just first say what a liquid crystal is. We kind of know what liquid crystals are. Probably this is display, it's a liquid crystal display here. But when liquid crystals are, are anisotropic fluids, they're composed of rod like molecules which can order themselves. And actually I saw a very nice just uh, two weeks ago on, on, on these fluids. Uh, and depending on the temperature, they may exist in sort of a solid like ordered phase. They can be slightly disordered or they can actually be completely disordered. And they don't support shear though, okay. Uh, and this is sort of the same thing showing a, a few more of the states here. So high temperature isotropic state, lower the temperature a little bit, you get an ordering, but it's just kind of in one direction, but you can also get very complex ordering like twist ordering, and you can get this sort of ordering, it's called a smectic state where you have ordering and then you have layered ordering. And so you can, you can have lots of interesting things happen. And in those applications I was showing you, what's making them function is basically a changing from state to state. That's really what's going on in the system. And and in the liquid crystal elastomers, what you have is you have these molecules that give the ordering, and then they are cross-linked together to make long chains. Okay, so you have elasticity and this ordering at the molecular scale. And this scale is very small, just a few nanometers. Okay. And you can have the materials made as single domain where everything is kind of ordered in, in one direction, or you could have like a multi-grain material. You can have local ordering here, local ordering here. In here, so you can have a, a polygrain or polydomain system, as it's called. Uh, and, and, the, and the way that they're, they're built up is you have these stiff molecules, which are called mesogens, uh, and you have uh, cross linkers and you have spacers, and you, you can, you can uh, n functionalize these things together to make a, a complete network. The thing that 
produces the interesting behaviors is the fact that if you make the material and then you zoom in with an optical microscope in this case, so this is a uh, polarized uh, fluorescent optical microscope image, and you see these bands here. And what you have is in each band, you have the material where the mesogens are lined up in one direction versus another. And during the heating or the deformation of the material, you are switching the orientation in the bands. And that switch actually gives you very large deformations, okay? And this actually image just shows you the power of using a fluorescent optical micros microscopy over just normal polarized optical microscopy. But it was in the, in the paper that I stole it from, so that's why it's published. There. So this is what happens in the polymers. In, in those metallic-like materials, um, you have something similar going on. Uh, and these are some images from the group out of Minnesota, Dick James group, and one of his former students, Chu, who made these images, which were an incredible feat of experimentation. But what the colors represent, these, these again are polarized images of polished specimens. What you're looking at with each color here is a different phase of material. And you can switch the phase either with heat, mechanical loading, or in the polymers, you can do it with light. In these materials, you can't do it with light, but you can do it with magnetism. Uh, so, and, and you get this very fine banding here that you, that you flip back and forth. And the, the orientation of these bands uh, is very important in the modeling, but I, I won't go into it. But these inter the, the main point is, is that these interfaces move back and forth. And the state of the material which is represented by the colors here from the micrograph really dictates what you see physically. And, and this process occurs rather quickly. This is a real time image of a polished specimen that's just being heated and cooled. So it, it's a fat transformation in the metals. In the polymers, it, it's not as quick, but it's still, you know, seconds kind of types of transformations. Yeah, of course. And so this is just going back and forth. And you can see that there's also a probabilistic nature to this process because as the material is transforming from say, this is the high temperature phase, when it's cooled down, it produces this pattern here, but the pattern is different each time it heats and cools. But there is an invariant to that image that you see there. So, and that, that's important is that, that, that there's an invariant there because you can't hope to model materials at this scale because well, you can see there's a, there's a randomness. Uh, but notwithstanding the patterns that you see and the fact that, you know, it's light blue, dark blue, and that there is this pattern in here, which all colors mean different states, those patterns are important for, for the responses. And just to give you a sense of the scale of these images here, this is from Nick Shire's group in Antwerp. Uh, this scale bar here is 3.2 angstroms, okay? So the patterns can be extremely fine in these materials. So, you know, this, this distance here is just a few nanometers here uh, in this system. And I've drawn this sort of zigzag line here you can imagine the amount of strain that you can induce by heating and cooling. This is at, at low, low temperature. You have the zigzag. When you heat this, this zigzag line extends into a straight line. Okay. And that's real deformation that you're going to see. So there's nothing small about this in this. Now, you have this fine scale pattern, but there's no hope. I mean, I, mean, I could try and make a, a theory of this and mesh it down to this scale, but that'd be insane, right? It, I mean, okay, I could simulate something that's a few nanometers on size, but I'm an engineer, so it's not gonna get me very far. Uh, what I'm interested is in something like this, uh, that I have a fine scale pattern, so yellow, blue. This, by the way, over here that you're looking at, which looks green, is just yellow, blue. Okay, so I just, I just made this thing. This is going pixel by pixel here. You can, if you look very closely, you'll see some blue dots there. Okay. But this is what you're after. You're after a model that's using as its state variable green. But knowing that I have green, I want to be able to interpret how much yellow and blue I have in my system. 
Okay. So that's the real objective here in terms of a model is that you want a macro model, one that is dealing with variables on this scale, but is informing you about that scale down there. Okay, and you want to skip everything in between because that, that scale down there is the angstrom scale. And up here, I'm at the, let's say the, the micron or millimeter scale up here. So that's, that's what we're at. Okay, so, so that's, that's sort of a, a, a pictorial description of, of what's going on. Uh, so the question is, well, how do you model that? Okay, and and the thing that's important here is that the, the phases of the material are, are what is controlling the response. So each phase needs to be uh, defined by a material state parameter. Uh, and in the case of the metals, there's actually a discrete set of strains that represents the different phases because I can get a phase, let's say a cubic phase and a tetrinal phase, and there's a strain that goes between those two deformations or those states, or maybe it's monoclinic or, or whatever. Uh, in the liquid crystal last word, it's actually a continuous set of states that you can have. So it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a bit more complicated. Uh, and the state parameter really defines what is the low energy configuration of the material. Okay. And, and one way of, of thinking about that is this little cartoon here. This is the discrete case. Uh, actually, I guess this is a picture that I, I drew for nickel aluminum. Uh, and what you have is for each state that the material can be in, there is an energy well that you can use for the stress strain. And, the, and it's zero at some place, or it has a minimum at some value of strain here. And at the high temperature state is here. Uh, and let's say the, the minimum is at zero strain. And so the difference in those strains there can be quite large, and that's what's giving you the behavior. And when I deform the material, I can move the material from one state to another. And it's always going to try and find which one of these wells is the one that's lowest. Okay. So I apply some load onto the system. I calculate the energy for all these different states it could be in, and which one comes out minimum, that's a state that I see in the experiment. Okay. And when I see those patterns, it's a situation where two materials or three materials or three different states have the same minimum. Okay. So that, that, that's sort of the, the mental picture that goes with it. Mathematically, it looks like this. So I have an energy for each one of those states indexed by I. And the overall energy of the material is just, which is this W over here, is just the min over all of those. So I, you give me the strain, I calculate the W for each phase, I just take the minimum. And the, I zero all of those wells someplace with a transformation strength. Okay. It's a pretty nasty looking energy if you think about it. And in the continuous case, it's almost the same thing. But now your state variable takes values. Of, it's a direction in space that so you can think of as taking directions on, on, on the sphere. And, and in in this case here, there's a very famous relationship, this bladen tarantev warner trace formula, as it's called, which gives you the energy of that system, F being the deformation gradient. L is this something known as the step length tensor. If you expand this out, you can have it in terms of the director D, which is the orientation, and then right and left Cauchy green tensors. Uh, this is the original orientation of the director of the material. Uh, this energy is really peculiar if you're, if you're knowledgeable of finite deformation mechanics, uh, you, you know that this thing has to be objective. So when we're taught about energies in, in our first classes, you say, okay, well, it's objective, it has to depend on B or C, right? Uh, because the rotation can't play a role. But you'll, if you look at this, there's an F there. So the rotation matters here. So the R and the polar decomposition matters. It is objective though. This energy is still frame invariant, but it depends on R, which is very curious. So it's, it's kind of an interesting energy. Okay, so if you have this energy, so this is just a continuous version of what's here, which is a discrete version. And now I'm going to do a boundary value problem, let's say. I take the energy of the body, so I integrate my F, and then I try and minimize it, find the deformation that will minimize it, right? So 
F is the gradient of P there. And the problem with this though, is that this energy is non-convex that's sitting inside here, okay? And when that thing is non-convex, then my total energy in my system is not weakly lower sum semi-continuous. And so when I try to minimize the energy, I'm gonna form patterns in the thing, but when I try and evaluate at the, at the pattern, I'm going to not see the minimizer. Okay. And, and let me try and articulate that with a, a simple example. This is known as the Volza problem. And so what I have is a rod and I have some kind of elastic medium around it. And I'm gonna take the whole thing and I'm gonna push it down some distance UL, okay? So if it's linear elastic, it's just gonna get displacement will be zero here and it'll linearly increase to the value of UL, right? Okay. Now I'm gonna do one thing that's a little tricky, that green bit there. I'm gonna give it this strain energy here, okay? So it's like this problem where you have multiple minimizers. So, so there's two local minima there. And it, uh, it's a little tricky here because I put a square there, right? And there's a square inside there. Normally you wouldn't have this one in here. Right? And, and so the, the total energy of the bar itself is just W evaluated on the gradient. And then there's this, uh, because I have this elastic medium on the outside, it's the difference from the affine solution to whatever U I have, okay? And so I want to minimize the energy here and the boundary conditions are at the bottom, it's zero displacement at the top, it's U L, okay? So, I need to try and reduce both of these terms here. If I just pick the affine solution there, I'm going to get a term, an energy that will be, the second term is zero, but I'm going to get something non-zero for the first term if the applied strain is someplace between one and minus one. Okay. So I can think about doing the next thing, which is instead of doing that affine solution, I can pick a solution that has strain one and minus one, okay? That gets rid of the first term here because I'll be sitting here and here, okay? But then I'll have something non-zero here, okay? So I can think of, well, what can I do next? What, the thing that I'm, I'm paying a price for here is all this area between these two curves. So I can generate a solution that is of these two slopes here, but less area between the two curves. So I can take something that looks like this, okay? And now I have a sequence of minimizers. I can keep going and I can make a solution is that jumps back and forth. That's my fine microstructure that I showed in all those pictures. And the weak limit of this sequence is just gonna be this affine solution, here. okay? But it's a little peculiar. Right. First of all, my solution is not some kind of nice differentiable function, first of all. Uh, and I do have derivatives in my energy, so I'm playing some fast and loose with the, the mathematics a little bit here. But this is this is the weak limit. Uh, and, and I have this very strange thing. If I look at the weak limit and evaluate the energy there, I get something that's not zero. But the limit of the sequence of energies on any one of those zigzag things is heading to zero. Okay. And what I really, what's interesting is that the gradient of the weak limit is only defined probabilistic. Okay. I know how much, what fraction is slope minus one and what fraction is slope plus one. Okay. But I don't really know much more about it. And, and that's exactly this picture here. What I care about is being able to describe things here, but knowing probabilistically how much yellow and how much green is in this picture, how much yellow and how much blue is in this picture. That's what matters. Okay. And just to relate this back to the physics, th this is just the example of the liquid crystal elastomer. If I, if I take this material, for instance, and it's, it's fabricated so the mesogens are all lined up, and I decide that I want to extend the material laterally, uh, the, the mesogens can, do one of two things. They can rotate left or they can rotate right, okay? And, and I can layer rotations left and right together 
which involves a shear of a layer, such that when I average this, all I'm going to do is get uniform extension. Okay. And I just want to know what the percentage of left and what percentage of right is in my model. So that's what I'm really after. Okay. So the question now is, well, how do you do that? Okay. And what's important is, is to have some notions of, of convexity. So we have usual convexity, right? This basic definition here, if you evaluate on a linear combination of arguments, you live below the linear combination evaluated on the arguments. Uh, that, that, of course, doesn't work in finite deformations, because if I take a free energy, it can't be convex. Well, first of all, I know I have, have non-uniqueness of solutions, so that, that's not going to work, but also it violates frame difference. Okay. Um, a better or a, a weaker notion of convexity is, is John Ball's polyconvexity, which says that I can write my energy in terms of another function that's convex uh, simultaneously on all the minors of the deformation group. Okay. And then I can prove existence of solutions, but not uniqueness, which is fine because it's finite. Uh, a slightly weaker notion due to Maury, who's actually had an office in a building that I can see from my office in the 1950s, uh, is this notion of quasi-convexity. Uh, and it, it's Definition of function f is quasi convex if it satisfies this property. And th this is a really unusual formula if, if you look at it. It looks like a homogenization formula for a material, but there is this domain over which you're doing the integral, and it's for all domains. Okay. So it's really peculiar. Uh, and and it, it, the, the definition looks easy, but it, it's actually very hard to determine whether functions are quasi convex or not. And it's really hard to apply this formula. But it, what Maury showed was that if you have a quasi-convex energy density, then that energy for the whole body is weakly lower sum and continuous. So sequences always live above the, the, the energy functional evaluated at the weak limit. So you, so the, so you get uh, good behavior. Uh, there is one other version of a convexity that a lot of us know is rank one convexity, which says that if you're on a rank one line in space deformations, then you get elliptic Euler equations. So, uh, but that's even weaker. And, the, and these are all implications going this way, and none of them go that way except in special cases. Uh, if you're in one dimension, they're all equal to each other. But in 3D, all the implications go in this direction. Okay. Now, the, the basic idea in, in producing models is that we're in a situation where we don't have something that's quasi-convex, so we don't have weak lower summit continuity, so we don't have solutions. And what we want to do is change the problem to make it quasi-convex. And so the, the, the basic idea is you're going to do what's called relaxation, and you're going to repair this defective energy by just simply finding the largest quasi-convex function that lives below the one that we started. And in the case of the discrete system, you can do what, something that's not quite that, it's called cross quasi-convexification, where you're going to try and solve this problem here. Uh, and, and in this case here, I can actually make a, a fair bit of headway in, into the problem. And, and the idea really in, in a cartoon, it, it, it's hard to draw these pictures because in 1D, all the concepts of convexity are the same. So this really is a cartoon, but you're starting with an energy that's not quasi-convex. This blue line here would be the convexification of it, uh, but quasi-convexification is something weaker and you'll get another curve in here. So it's not going to be convex, uh, but it's going to allow you to retain information about what the fractions of various phases are, that's represented by C, which is a which is a, a list of probabilities of different phases. Chi is just the indicator function for each phase. And you can actually make pretty good progress on that one. So in, in the case of shape memory alloys, you can actually do this analytically using Fourier transfer methods to a certain point. For some materials, you can actually continue it and do it by hand. And we've shown that. 
Uh, and for other cases where you can't do it by hand, you can get a very good balance tool, okay, which turned out to be exact in many cases, which is somewhat unexpected. And in the case of liquid crystal elastomers on Di Simone and, and some of his coworkers actually did this even in finite deformation by hand, they did the relaxation calculation, which is mathematically a real tour de force. It's a very impressive piece of work. And we've recently extended this out to, to the viscoelastic case, okay? But once you have the energy, one of these analytic expressions, then the next steps are sort of our usual game. Second law, look at the dissipation inequality, write a rate equation for the evolution of the state variable, uh, you know, implying Coleman null Coleman gertner arguments, that produces your stress frame relations and your evolution laws. And, and, and then you're off to the races, really. And so what I'd like to, to, to do in closing is just show a few demonstrations of how this works out. So the first one is, uh, the case of, of nickel aluminum. Nickel aluminum is a shape memory alloy, uh, but you don't really see shape memory effects unless you fabricate it as a single crystal. If you fabricate it as a, a polycrystalline material, when you try and deform it, it just deforms like an elastic material. Okay. And so this is an example of a calculation. So this is a finite element calculation. I forgot the reference, it's out of one of the papers by Garrett Hall, one of my PhD students. But what you have here is, in this sample over here, it's a single crystal, you deform it, it starts elastically, then you get a phase transformation, and then the transformation ends, and then starts to go elastically again. This curve over here, represented here, is when this sample here is a polycrystalline material. So, and it's what I call poor man's homogenization is just you take the elements and certain chunks of them are in one state and certain chunks of them are in another state and then you just pull all the sample, okay? And so this demonstrates that you can differentiate between a, a system that's going to transform and one that isn't using one of these relaxation theories. So that, that was a nice demonstration of that. Uh, this, this, this test here, uh, on this copper nickel aluminum alloy was done by uh, Tom Shields up in Minnesota. This is an amazing set of experiments that he did. He fabricated a single crystal and then he cut specimens of different orientations out of the sheet that he had fabricated and then he did tests on them. And this is the test over here. This is the calculation. The, the properties for the calculation were fit onto this loop. So this loop here was fit to that. Uh, these two are the predictions, really. Uh, one of the things that, that's interesting about this is that you'll notice that on these two specimens, he did a load on load. And this one, there's a little X there because it broke. And what occurred here was after it broke, what he did is he redesigned the experimental stage and he took the cross head at the top and he put it on a, on a bearing that allowed it to float in the plane. So this is a really complicated experiment. So you can pull on it, but the specimen is allowed to move in the plane at the top. Uh, and what he found is that when he redid the experiment, that there was a huge lateral deformation in the calculation. And when we do the calculation here, we also see that large lateral deformation. So not only does the relaxation theory provide you the primary behavior, it also gives you this sort of secondary behavior system. And the other bit of secondary behavior that we'll predict is that we can predict out the calculations because we're getting the probabilities of the phases, we can we can plot them in time as we as we do the loading or the unloading in the system. And, and we can predict which phases they're numbered by their transformation strain. We, we can predict which phases will occur. And these phases actually match what's seen in the experiment. So when he did the experiment, he polished the surfaces and looked at the traces of the lines and knowing the angles of those lines, you can actually back calculate what the phases are. And so this actually predicts the, the exact same thing as in the experiment. So this is very successful kind of theory. Just a couple of more examples. This is a, this is a single crystal 
of a copper nickel aluminum alloy again. Uh, it was made by Peter Sittner in the Czech Republic in Prague. Uh, this is kind of an inter interesting story because I, I gave a talk and Peter was in the audience and I showed a calculation. He says, well, that's not what happens. And then he says, I have that specimen in my drawer in my office. Okay, and, and then we, we, we then had a, a collaboration to figure out what was going on. Uh, and it turned out we were both correct uh, in our assessment. And so he went back and he took this specimen. He actually, he had two of them. And, and the first time, is, it's, it's really hard to make this, right? This is a single crystal. And, and the dimensions here, this is, this, is about, uh, this is about a centimeter here, okay? So this is a big single crystal, okay? It's got all this threading and everything. It's, it's very fancy. Uh, he had two of them. And the first time he tried it in an experiment, the experiment didn't go well and the specimen broke, okay? And so it, he just put the other specimen away in his drawer, not knowing what to do with it. And so after I had given this talk showing the response of this thing, he and I got together and, and we redid this experiment here. And, and so we, we took it and we pulled the specimen. So it's being driven with an axial strain, okay? And you get this spontaneous twist in the bar, okay? And this is just the stress strain response here. Uh, again, showing here. So here's the actual displacement, and then you get twist. And you can see it's five degrees of twist, so it's a lot of twist, okay? This is just the shear strain. Okay. Uh, now, the experiment that uh, Peter had tried originally was a different experiment. And that experiment was one where he twisted it. So here I'm pulling it and it twists, right? What he did was he just twisted the bar. And in that experiment, the bar broke, okay? Where the expectation was you twist it and it's just gonna naturally expand. Okay, if you look at this one, right, it looks like there's a, there's a coupling between extension and twist and that those two things should go together. Okay, the, the calculation that I shown was this extension one where you get the twist. Okay. And when you do the, we went back and we did the twist calculation. And when we did the twist calculation, what we saw is that there was no phase transformations in the bar using the relaxed energy. And so you get this, you get a little bit at the top here. And so you're getting a huge amount of stress into the system and then the thing just snaps. And so the relaxed energy produces this quite nice. So the, the, these are uh, demonstrations of the utility of doing the relaxation. Uh, just a, a, a couple of, of more demonstrations here. These are, uh, models that we've done with relaxed energies for liquid crystal elastomers uh, that incorporate also viscoelasticity. Uh, these are experiments at two different strain rates, 0.1 and 0.01 per second. This is just tension, so stress strain. These are the calculations. Uh, the fit's not exact. There, there's a lot of complexity in, in modeling these materials, but it's, it's relatively good. Uh, and importantly, uh, if you look deeper into the prediction of the calculation, you can see a number of features that are known from the experiment. So for instance, in this experiment, there's a director that's vertical and you're pulling horizontally, and then the director rotates. And we get that, so you, it's, it's, it's 90 degrees vertical, pull it, you reach the peak, it flies down very quickly into the horizontal and then keeps going and then when you unload it, it stays in that horizontal direction, which is what's known experimentally to happen. And we can also see that in the system, you, this red curve here is F12, that's the shear. And that's in that layer diagram that I showed you earlier, is that once you hit the transformation, you get a whole bunch of shear into the system. And then as you continue, that shear disappears. Okay, and as you, as you, fully rotate the director and then the thing just extends naturally. So you can predict the microstructure of the system. Uh, another thing that's known about these materials is that they have really anomalously large dissipation. 
Okay. So if you look at the TAN delta, it's got crazy high values. And what we can see interrogating through the calculation is that if we look at the stress strain, that the equilibrium stresses are down here and you have this huge non-equilibrium stress. And that's what's contributing. And so there's two things here. It's the, there's viscosity on the director and there's viscosity in the polymeric network. The two of them conspire to give you this very large dissipating quality of these materials. Uh, just one last example here. This is just to show you that how well the relaxation models work is that in this case here, the director is horizontal and you're pulling horizontal. Okay. And so this is an experiment in the simulation. Uh, we, we can get the magnitudes and we can get a bit of, of the looping correct and we can get the effect of strain rate. Uh, the stresses themselves aren't quite precise, but uh, that requires some refinement of the model. So, so that, that was my last example. Uh, so I'm well on time. Uh, Hopefully it wasn't too technical, but uh, so I just made my closing remarks because relaxation really is, is a key technique when you have certain types of very complex problems. Uh, and uh, I'll point out my, my reference here to my figure is uh, Dolly 2, uh, which is an AI engine I generated that this morning. <laughs> and you can see the nice uh, layered uh, microstructure there in the umbrella. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, I don't know if you, uh, there's any question in the audience. Uh, by the way, uh, this also extends to the people who is uh, online. So please, uh, if you have any question, open your microphone, please. Yeah, so in this twisting experiment, there's not really, I mean, am I right in understanding that uh, applied strain cannot be attained by mixing the low energy strain, something like this? That's a, an interesting question. So it's, so there's, when, when you do that twisting experiment, the, the way I think about it in my head is I have all these wells and I'm going to apply a strain which is going to tip all the wells. Okay. But there's a difference between an applied strain that's axial and one that's twisting. And so when you twist it, you're not dropping any of the wells. And so they just stay. And because the reference configuration is, is the is the high temperature austenitic phase, which is cubic in that material. It just stays in that cubic state. So by twisting the bar, you're not moving any of the wells in a way that lowers one of the Martensic wells, so there's no transformation that happens. Whereas when you pull on it, you tip one of the wells down, and that allows it to move that way, and that strain also has a, has a twist component to it. It's the barrier. Yeah. It's very curious because usually when you see a coupling one way, you think that it occurs the other way. But yeah, it's it's, it's very hard to think in these dimensions though because they're very high dimensional problems. Well, okay, six, but I can't I can't I can't visualize anything in six dimensions in my head. I can only do the two D. <laughs> okay. Any other question? Uh, the internet um, questions. Well, I want to thank you for your interesting talk. Uh, uh, I really learned too many things, <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of way to do it, to, to know exactly probably I know you you do that, you, you do it. And I want to thank you in the name of Sydney and the several talks. Okay. Thank you.